afternoon, good evening to all of you uh, for joining us as we continue the Global Economic Ideas Festival 2022, the first edition and of course virtual edition as well. Uh, the GIF uh, is, is an annual global conference of the ICCE, which is the Institute of Certified Chartered Economists. And for the benefit of those that have joined us for the first time, of course, in the previous sessions, I've had a chance to uh, talk briefly about the ICC, who we are, what we do, and why a platform like the GIF is very important to us. So the ICC is a professional body, um, uh, which is a qualification of education economics in the professional sense. And as mo most of us might be aware that other professional bodies in, in other fields of discipline, for example, in accounting, uh, in finance, in marketing, and a whole lot. So we are in the field of economics. And so what we do is that we provide a certification which goes in the form of undertaking some uh, uh, examination through our curriculum that is structured, all details are available on the ICC website. And of course, most importantly, we try to create uh, collaborative learning platforms, um, which is the GIF force within that. So here we're trying to, uh, create a platform that uh, engineer conversation that are relevant to the global economy. Most importantly, the kind of conversation that economists, um, as we're raising, will be part of that kind of uh, platform to create solution uh, that, that will benefit the entire world. So we're very privileged that for the first time in our history, we are hosting the Global Economic Ideas Festival. We've, we've already had an impressive uh, lineup of speakers in our previous sessions. And this is the last but one for today, uh, being the opening day, November uh, 23rd, 2022. And we go again tomorrow, uh, which will wrap up our two days for the Global Economic Ideas Festival. We are very hopeful that in 2023, we will host an in-person uh, physical Global Economic Ideas Festival. And so on that note, if you have any uh, interest, you want to partner with your firm or any such opportunity that you're seeking, we'll be more than happy to work with you. Uh, I will definitely be your point man. Of course, most of the emails that you're receiving, you can reply to any of them, and we'll be more than happy to work with you towards the Global Economic Ideas Festival 2023, as you work to engineer a conversation that are relevant to the world economy. At this point, I will be delving deeper and, and straight into the session for today, which is gonna be for the next one hour and 15 or so minutes. Uh, we're very privileged to have an impressive lineup of speakers uh, that have worked uh, extensively across various jurisdictions and across uh, uh, multiple you know, uh, uh, organizations uh, to share with us some insights. And, and, and we've already had discussion on some topics and now we're going on global health care, uh, which I'll hand over to the moderator for the session and the person of Professor Azar Hussein who is a, a member of the International Board of Standard of the ICCE to uh, take over and, and introduce our impressive lineup of speakers. And then of course, we can delve deeper into the conversation. Thank you for, for joining us and we'll give you the chance to bring your questions. I'm sure Professor Hussein will mention that. So you get a chance to be part of the conversation. And this session is recorded for, for, for all of us to be aware. So it's recorded, which will be available of course. On, on our YouTube channel and other platforms. So thank you very much, Prof. Please uh, uh, take over now. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, hello to everyone. Uh, good morning to some of you and good afternoon to others and maybe good evening to the rest. Welcome to this Global Economic Ideas Festival, GEIF, in the session about the future of global health how can we pay for healthcare financing? There can be no discussion about the future of the global healthcare system without a thorough commitment on the level of financial resources and capital required. So health financing is a core function of health systems that can enable progress towards universal health coverage by improving effective service coverage and financial protection. This makes financial resources a critical input to health systems. At a minimum, these are necessary to purchase medicines and supplies, build health facilities, and pay for healthcare workers. Health spending 
back in 2016, where we have figures reached around 8 trillion US dollars, that is about 8,000 billion US dollars, which is about 8.5% of the global GDP. If we translate that into purchasing power parity adjusted dollars, that reaches more than 10 trillion US dollars. Despite the launch of innovative financing at the turn of this millennium, development assistance for health peaked in 2013 at only 38 billion US dollars. This is a very small number compared to the 8,000 billion US dollars that are spent on health worldwide. So the question is, how can a new financial architecture for global health secure the future of well-being, human capital, as well as societal cohesion? In order to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, we need a unique combination of capital and innovation from across the public, private, and philanthropic sectors. So this panel will explore how together we can connect global health investors from the public, private, and philanthropic sectors across all asset classes to build a global health marketplace in which reimagined financial models, novel technologies, and uncommon partnerships can harness untapped potential to address the world's most urgent health challenges. And to do this, uh, I have three distinguished speakers. We have Dr. Lemma W. Sandbet. He is a William E. Mayer Chair, Professor of Finance at the University of Maryland. So he belongs to the academic world in the United States. We also have Dr. Jennifer Blanke, who is a non-executive director for African Risk Capacity Limited. And this is a disaster risk insurance company based in Switzerland. Dr. Blanke is also a former vice president of the African Development Bank and former chief economist of the World Economic Forum. Last but not least, we also have CEO Adel Simbo Belo Okiri, who has an MSc from London School of Economics and is the CEO of A1 Healthcare Limited, which is a health management organization from Nigeria. And I am Professor Azar Hussain. I belong to Roskilde University in Copenhagen in Denmark. Let me go to straight to the panelists and uh, start asking first, Dr. Blanke. You're a development economist who has worked across numerous sectors and priorities. If we think about healthcare in developing countries at the country level, government wants to ensure an effective healthcare system and they need to find the financial resources to deliver such a healthcare system. Donors provide some of those resources but for them, other considerations often predominate. What is wrong with this picture, would you say? Thanks a lot, Azar, and, and please call me Jennifer. We're all among colleagues here. Um, and uh, this is about sort of rolling up our sleeves, I think. Um, that's a really good question, uh, I think, for setting the scene. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk about solutions yet. I'm gonna start off with what some of the challenges are and then hopefully we can delve into the solutions. I think we all know how important good healthcare is for development, uh, and yet COVID uh, provided a stark reminder of the great inequities uh, in terms of access to healthcare around the world. You know, both within countries and certainly across countries. You know, many governments uh, in developing countries are doing their best uh, to provide healthcare to their citizens, but it's challenging because they have strapped resources in general, particularly in today's you know sort of difficult economic climate. Um, and I don't want to be a downer. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, beyond sort of the numbers that you just mentioned in terms of how much funding is, is, is missing, we also have to recognize it's not just about the amount, but also about the way that, you know, it is funded and the way that funds are coordinated uh, that needs to be addressed. Because while developing country governments certainly need external support uh, to finance their health care, the challenge is that they don't always see eye to eye with donors. Uh, and then the private sector is, you know, 
obviously engaged to a certain extent or actually needs to be much more engaged. And we'll certainly hear about uh, in, uh, insurance uh, in a moment. Uh, but the donors are, are quite important and, and there's a real challenge there. On one hand, you have developing country governments uh, who generally want to build effective health systems, right? They want to be able to deliver essential health services uh, in an efficient way. Uh, and they also want to protect citizens from the potentially devastating costs of severe illness. God forbid this should happen. Uh, on the other hand, uh, donors uh, often have their own priorities. Uh, when it comes to bilateral donors, so country government donors, uh, governments choose to provide funds for a variety of reasons. Uh, could be, you know, sort of promoting their own vision of development or issues that they care about, uh, or buttressing, you know, global health security more generally, kind of, you know, sort of what we saw recently in terms of, you know, protecting against pandemics, because it also matters for them. The other thing that's very important here is that in order to justify their spending to their electorates, given that, of course, this is taxpayer money that we're talking about, donor governments often tie financing uh, to things that can be easily measured. Uh, and what that means is that, uh, you know, they generally finance specific interventions or programs. It's much harder to drum up support within countries, donor countries, uh, to support health systems or government budget uh, more generally. And this can create a disconnect between donor contributions uh, and the need uh, needs of countries. Now, all of this, you know, you mentioned that things changed at the beginning of the millennium. Um, it has been further complicated, actually, by the rise over the last 20 years or so of private foundations and international funds that have come on the scene. Um, Gates Foundation, Global Fund, Gavi, uh, and so on and so forth. They have brought in large amounts of grant money for specific health priorities for the most part. Now, these organizations are clearly doing a lot of good. Um, but the way they function also can muddy the waters uh, for, you know, sort of ensuring proper coordination. For example, uh, they often grant support based on application processes rather than, you know, sort of an assessment of greatest need. Uh, and of course, they are focusing on their particular areas of focus. Um, another challenge is that the majority of fund needed uh, in national health sectors is for long term of recurrent costs. And you mentioned a couple of the medicine, salaries, basic infrastructure, whereas again, donor funding tends to be geared towards shorter term program costs. So there's a disconnect in terms of time uh, as well. Finally, in terms of these challenges, there's also really a lack of coordination among donors. They're trying, you know, we've seen that, uh, but there's at least a hundred major organizations that are working on financing, international organizations, financing health, um, but there's not, a single you know, institution that has a mandate to coordinate among them or clarify their roles and responsibilities. The WHO is very important, but it focuses on other things. Um, so you know, that can lead to overlap in efforts. And sometimes, and I, you know, I know this from my time working in develop, development finance, even stepping on each other's toes, uh, which is really uh, not ideal. So the result of all this is that financial support is often earmarked for specific diseases and interventions over a specific time horizon that might not be well aligned with national health needs, and also that countries sometimes have to prioritize programs that might not reflect their most urgent needs. Taking a piecemeal program-specific approach makes it much more difficult for them to holistically finance and run their own health systems uh, within countries. Now, one last thing to, to keep in mind uh, in this area, because I don't want to put all of the blame on the doorstep of donors who are really trying to do and are doing a lot of good, uh, is that developing countries, and we know this is true, often have, you know, are limited in terms of how much funding they can actually absorb in an effective way. Um, and this can is for many reasons, you know, whether it's governance challenges, weak institutions, or just, you know, kind of shortages in, in skilled um, health workers. And that means that it's sometimes hard to put resources to good use. Um, so going back to what you asked me, what's wrong with this picture? Um, it's despite uh, the fact that many people and organizations are working very hard uh, and with the best of intentions to support developing country healthcare, the world is simply just not delivering uh, the quality healthcare that is needed for everyone. Uh, and we really do need better ways of delivering this basic human need that is so critical for growth and development. I really look forward uh, to discussing with my fellow panelists here today and getting into the nuts and bolts of which financial mechanisms and innovations can make a real difference in delivering much better health outcomes around the world. Thanks a lot, Azar. Thank you, Jennifer, for your insights. Now I have a question for Professor Lema Senbet. 
sustainable financing for universal health coverage is not just about spending more, it's about spending smarter and using innovative ways to raise funds. So the question to you is, how can countries achieve this, especially in low-income countries? Um, first of all, greetings uh, from Washington. Uh, it's real privilege uh, for me to speak at this August forum. And then I also discovered this morning that this is uh, my birthday. Um, so, um, yes. Happy birthday. Happy <laughs> birthday. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. So yeah, you're right. It's not just uh, healthcare spending uh, that matters, uh, but also spending smart and innovate. And I heard someone saying uh, more money for health with more health for the buck. Um, so let me uh, weigh in both the smart spending and innovation. Uh, let me also alert you that I'm primarily a financial economist. I'm not like health expert. I'm coming from a finance uh, angle. So I think the, the fallacy of more spending is universal. It is in, that, in the advanced countries, in the low-income countries, and that is acutely awakened by COVID-19. Uh, remember the disparities in mortality and hospitalization just in the U.S., where the marginalized and population and lower echelon were heavily affected disproportionately. And of course, you also that you see that in the low-income countries when you have difficulty accessing the rural areas. So again, what that really glaringly shows is uh, inefficient allocation and reallocation of funding. It's not just the availability of the spending. So uh, as we know, uh, when you have um, huge resources, which are involved in this case, there are obvious wastages and inefficiencies. And I wanted to uh, weigh in how you curtail, what kind of measures you could use to curtail inefficiencies, and also uh, how uh, by leveraging through innovation, partnerships and capacity building, you can actually get more for the buck. So the first, I think, is, is that uh, when we start dealing with healthcare spending, we should try and do something more than healthcare spending or healthcare improvement. But as a way of doing that, also impacting finance. For instance, it's a case where finance is involved. So is there an opportunity to improve healthcare and also improve finance at the same time. So uh, I think um, it is important uh, first to identify priority areas. Uh, for instance, um, especially in the low-income countries, you know, primary care health is, is a big deal. And also the issue of prevention as opposed to kind of waiting down the line to get hospitalized. So if you actually invest in uh, preventive um, care, uh, then you can actually mitigate a uh, huge cost uh, coming down the line. So again, uh, this also means that you can actually uh, invest more in primary uh, health care. So this is one case where you have a duality of improved uh, primary health care and improved spending. Uh, the other is, uh, you know, minor items, maybe unnecessary and wasteful testing, uh, minimizing excessive use of supplies, and also put into places uh, monitoring and evaluation systems, including best practices, audit standards. But I wanted to say also something on the revenue side. Uh, so we are not, you know, healthcare is not somewhere in Pluto. It is grappling within the totality of revenue generation for the economy. Then the, the foundation for us is taxation. So the issue of efficiency and management of public source money is also very important for healthcare as well. Uh, in that context, uh, some people have even argued and gone beyond this, and maybe can we also uh, target uh, products and activities which are actually harmful? And again, get the duality of advantages in one way, uh, for instance, take uh, uh, alcohol or tobacco, right? 
uh, uh, cigarettes smoking in there. So, so in one way, uh, you're actually getting maybe more money, but at the same time, you're also, also improving health. And sometimes we don't spend much time thinking about capacity building. I mean, I, mean, I used to serve as, uh, so we didn't mention, but I was actually heading the African Economic Research Consortium for five years. At the heart of that is really capacity building. And I came away thinking that capacity building is needed across the board, across the board. You know, it would be health workers, administrators, even regulators. And this is also one place where development partners, apart from money, you know, provide technical assistance in building capacity. Uh, and then, of course, finally, I wanted to say about investment in technologies. And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes about that because that is really, really uh, big. Because again, you have a duality, a duality of uh, being smart and also innovative. Uh, so um, we have in finance, I'm going to bring the finance angle. So in, the, in finance, uh, one day I was preparing a talk for the World Bank and I found that fintechs are all over Africa. So these are uh, financial technology startups and they're also showing up in healthcare. So now you see uh, technology enabled financial services in terms of lending. You know, you can lend for health seekers who do not, who do have liquidity shortages and those services are in place. And also, uh, facilitating and, and creating more efficient efficiency in payments so that timely delivery of healthcare is achieved. So again, you have one, a duality of financial innovation and also healthcare uh, improvement. You could also see that, by the way, in the area of uh, payment, the payment system, even in wealth management. So, uh, so, so what that means is that we need to make sure that there is robust enabling environment environment to empower uh, fintechs uh, in finance. Let me actually um, conclude with one point here. Um, what I see here is that, you know, we say, okay, uh, finance is good for health, but I'm also finding that health is good for finance. So uh, this, this investment opportunities, okay? Uh, and the idea of uh, technology enabled uh, fintechs, which is really not because they're actually like well-meaning and socially impact, but they do that because they want to make money. So, to, so, that's, so it's a marriage of, of a capitalism and socialism, right? So, so these also help, it's also help us build more robust financial sector development. In fact, I'm now of the opinion, given that financial economy is coming from that angle, healthcare financing should be part of the overall financial sector innovation strategy of the economy. So I'm going to close that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lemon. Then we also have with us uh, Adesimbo Belo Okiri. And uh, you have been the CEO of our health maintenance organization in Nigeria for the last decade. And you have seen these issues from the front line. And you're also running a very successful company. And the question to you is that based on your experience, how do you see the financial and business landscape of healthcare successfully rolling out across Africa, but also beyond? Thank you. That's um, it's a crucial question to ask. Um, over the years, I mean, the general consensus is that um, healthcare sector in Africa, definitely in Nigeria and other countries like Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa, our healthcare sector has been underinvested in for so long. You know, the most obvious gaps were mm, exposed at um, at the height of the COVID crisis. Thankfully, though, you know, the um, very dire predictions didn't come to light. And um, most African countries, at least in sub-Saharan Africa, escaped considerably, you know, the worst of what had been predicted would happen. 
but what COVID did do was that it exposed all the huge gaps we had in our healthcare, especially on the supply side. Lack of adequate healthcare facilities. I remember at a certain time in Nigeria, we could count the number of um, ventilators in the country on, on one, one, one palm. And sometimes we didn't even have up to five. You know, so this has had some kind of silver lining because what it then meant was that most of the governments then realized, not just governments, but also private sector. Because during the height of the COVID crisis um, in Nigeria in particular, the private sector did form an alliance and established quite a number of, um, at that time, temporary large scale healthcare facilities to meet the needs of, of the people who fell ill due to the COVID virus. But what it showed was that um, the money was there <laughs> all along. <laughs> Only it wasn't being invested in healthcare. And when even the private sector saw a threat to their very existence and the way of life that we're all used to, they came up with the money. And the money hasn't completely come to a halt, even though COVID has ended. And I think the same would apply for a number of other African countries. The private sector, as well as the government, have woken up to the need to improve healthcare infrastructure, to improve funding to healthcare services as a whole, even the supply chain, whether it's for medicines, whether it's for vaccinations, vaccines, sorry, <laughs> whether it's for small appliances that can be manufactured locally. You have many African governments and many private sector parties now looking at what they can do to the healthcare systems in, in their respective countries. Um, I'm trying to bring my experience down home in Nigeria and not just look at the supply side, but also look at the demand side, you know, because if there is no effective demand backed up with funds, then, you know, the investment on the supply side also, you won't get the real benefit of it. And um, we can see that also changing in Nigeria very recently, just a couple of months ago, there was a law finally passed that makes it compulsory for all the residents of the country to subscribe to some form of health insurance cover. We didn't have that before. And all of that was to aid the whole country to move towards a place where we are moving away from the over 70% um, payment for healthcare being out of pocket, because that's what the statistics in Nigeria are saying now, about 70% of healthcare spend is from out of pocket. You know, and that's, you all know, very, very ineffective way of, of, of paying for healthcare. So this kind of law is meant to help us to achieve having more people be covered under some kind of healthcare, um, health, health plan, health insurance plan. Now, the developmental agencies and philanthropies that focus on health, like you said, Jennifer, they tend to focus more on specific initiatives and we find that the interventions are often not systemic. It, it makes, you know, that, that side is quite fragmented and, you know, African countries have no control over what the NGOs or what the philanthropic bodies are going to put their money in. Um, it would be good if there was some way to work together to make this happen. But I think also now the trend is that th that is being reversed. What we see now is um, developmental organizations asking what the priorities of communities are and what the priorities of governments are and seeing how they can fit into that. That is the wave of the future. Uh, and we're very thankful to, to, to discover that this has started to, to happen. The outlook to my mind, not just for Sub-Saharan Africa, but I think globally as a whole, is that we are moving more towards government and private sector, being more conscious of the gaps that exist in the healthcare systems across the world, and being more inclined to begin to invest more into the healthcare sector. Um, in Nigeria, that has been the case in the past um, two years. There was an initial law in investment activities across all sectors. But we have seen that started to come up again. And I mean, that, that's a good development. Another factor that can affect this kind of growth is, is um, skilled healthcare workers. 
you know, because if the investment comes in and we don't have the skilled healthcare workers, then there's a huge problem. And in recent years, we've seen a brain drain quite unlike what we have seen in, in quite a while happening in Africa, where you have nurses and doctors migrating en masse. I mean, even during the COVID season, there were planes landing in Nigeria just to airlift doctors and nurses to the United States of America and other parts of the world. I shouldn't just call out the USA, you know? And when all our health workers leave, how can the healthcare sector be transformed and how are we going to make continuous progress? So these are some of the issues that we grapple with, but I think on a whole, both governments, the developmental organizations, as well as the private sector have seen the need to invest more in healthcare. And this is going to continue, but we have to watch out for these inequalities and this show of power by the more, um, economically um, developed countries and how that power is being used, the financial power is being used to further erode whatever gains developing countries are making for their own healthcare systems. I think I'll just stop here, thank you. Thank you. And let me uh, come back to Professor uh, Lema. So what you're saying is that we need a coordinated and efficient ways to deliver financial support to develop strong healthcare systems in the developing world. At the same time, we see that low income countries, they remain far below the already required $60 a year per capita expenditure on healthcare, which was the need, according to the 2009 High Level Task Force on Innovative Financing for Health Systems, this is their estimates. And uh, this is required to just deliver the limited set of key health services for their citizens. So the question is how strategic and feasible is it to finance global health through a global health investment fund? Um. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, that is um, a very important question. Uh, first of all, I think I should say at the outset that it's in fact strategic and, and feasible. Uh, um, so the Global Health Investment Fund is intended to uh, support uh, late stage uh, technologies, uh, uh, basically in the uh, business of investing uh, in medical advances uh, with emphasis on infectious disease and malaria and so on. So the idea, by the way, I'm going to um, say this in two ways. One is the concept and the promise and the uh, vision. So I have no difficulty with the promise and vision. And um, well, one of the reasons here is that you are trying to tap into private capital and investors who are socially minded uh, and who, uh, who are convinced that, uh, that they can actually get a fair social return, rate of return uh, for their investments. So basically uh, where profits make, makes, uh, uh, makes social impact, or as I mentioned earlier, whereas capitalism actually makes social and. Uh, one of the uh, in interesting features is that it's a collaborative model. Uh, initially, it's a collaboration uh, between some flagship financial institutions uh, like JP Morgan, uh, Gates, uh, and, and also developing partners, um, uh, CEDA included. Uh, so uh, one of the functions of uh, the, the Gates Foundation and the developing partners is also provide uh, some kind of risk mitigation uh, schemes. Uh, and by the way, it's not 100%, you know, it's a partial. Uh, so, so, so there's also a risk sharing uh, dimension uh, to this. So, um, and then I started, uh, uh, after you alerted me about that question, I started looking at what they have done so far. And that's where I kind of got confused because uh, this thing was, uh, this came into existence in 2013. So it's, it's almost a decade now. And uh, I started looking at the portfolio 
a range of portfolio investments. Uh, they claim that they have some 12 and seven of them are completed. I also looked at the news coverage and kind of ended in somewhere in, um, a few uh, years back. So I think what, what, what I'm worried about is the, the transparency, uh, the performance uh, record of, of this fund. Uh, but I have a feeling that uh, when this came into existence, the challenges might have been under, uh, underestimated. One of which is uh, also this uh, whole area of uh, risk mitigation and the idea of attracting, you know, uh, potential investors uh, to risky technologies uh, for clinical, uh, basically to R&D. Basically, you're asking them to invest in R&D. And even if you come up with partial uh, loss coverage, um, um, there is still there is some... Um, some concern about the extent to which uh, risk is uh, shared sufficiently enough to actually generate a, a, a confidence. And um, and then of course, uh, you have to, these, these things have to exit, right? So you are talking about a technology, uh, not only that it has potential on the health side, but also has to have some kind of commercial success so that, so that so it can exit. And I noticed that uh, there were, I think, a couple, and then I think that's seven, which are uh, products in, the, in this category. Um, I also wanted to get a sense of uh, what they have done uh, with reference to COVID-19, whether or not the COVID-19 has actually impacted, you know, the mission and vision and the province of this fund. So uh, I am sensing I, um, I may be, maybe, maybe, maybe participant in this forum from that fund. Uh, but I, as an academic, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of left with incomplete information. And I would, not, I would like to know more uh, about this. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Professor. And can I get back to uh, Jennifer? So at a time when globalization has increased the risk of having isolated outbreaks of diseases, such as COVID-19, SARS, and avian influenza explored into global pandemics, what are some of the innovative mechanisms for addressing this challenge to healthcare? Okay, thanks, Azar. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go a little bit more into those questions of risk uh, that we were just hearing about. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, when we think about addressing outbreaks and diseases, as we've already heard multiple times today, um, what's most front of mind is COVID, right? Um, and the need to invest in developing preventative healthcare tools, vaccines. Um, the biggest challenge for developing countries with all this, I mean, it was done at lightning speed, um, but it's then ensuring that these innovations don't get hoarded uh, in rich countries. Um, and we've really seen way too much of that over the last couple of years. Um, so ensuring that there's sufficient financing also for the delivery um, and the distribution is, is really important. Uh, and you know, I won't go into this too much right now, but blended finance, and I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit more later, uh, can play an important role. Uh, you know, kind of doing a little of what you know we've been talking about, bringing together public and private investment uh, to deliver what's needed, um, especially given that we know. First of all, public sector funding will never be enough, but also the public sector can't possibly have the know-how. Uh, and um, so I'd like to get into that a little bit more later if we have time. Now, um, I just wanted to talk about, you know, the sort of outbreaks question. Um, we've heard about an important market-based approach that is important in healthcare in general, which is health insurance. Um, and it needs to be massively scaled up so that it reach, reaches many more people. If you go to a lot of countries, I mean, if you're middle or you know middle class, wealthy, you you have it, but it doesn't reach everyone else, and and that's very expensive. Um, and as Edison Bo, you know, talked so eloquently about, the private sector has lots of different roles to play, sort of across you know the whole arena in terms of providing basic health goods and services uh, more generally. Um, now, in addition, and, and I think what I wanted to, to mention uh, today is that there are also some new and innovative insurance mechanisms that have significant potential uh, to make a difference at the macro level. So sort of kicking stuff up uh, one level uh, from the individual. Uh, for example, I sit on the board, as you mentioned, of African Risk Capacity Limited, 
uh, which is not based in Switzerland. I live in Switzerland uh, because it's an African institution, uh, but it's a mutual insurance company um, that is providing a disaster risk insurance uh, to governments and smallholders in Africa. It's a social enterprise uh, working to build a culture of risk management and insurance uh, on the continent. Um, traditionally, the company has focused on weather-related uh, risks uh, like drought and flood. It's sort of the natural place to start. Um, but relevant to this discussion, uh, the company is just about to launch uh, a new innovative uh, insurance product, which will be addressing specifically outbreaks and epidemics in Africa. Um, it will be parametric insurance, so based on number of cases. Um, it will cover three diseases, Ebola, Marburg, and meningitis, and this is to get started. Uh, and countries will receive payouts if they reach a minimum number of cases, right? What's really important uh, when it comes to insurance uh, is that the claims will be paid uh, with within a few days uh, of um, the you know of the trigger uh, basically uh, being pulled. Uh, and what that means is it will provide rapid liquidity to governments uh, in responding and containing outbreaks instead of waiting for international to assistance, which sometimes arrives, sometimes doesn't arrive, and if and when it does come uh, is much later uh, in the game when much time has been lost and it's harder uh, to contain the outbreak. And I think the recent Ebola uh, outbreak in Uganda is a poignant reminder that this sort of financial innovation could go a long way in, in moving uh, quickly uh, to contain the spread of, of various outbreaks. Um, I also want to emphasize that the power of these types of financial mechanisms is not just in their speed, not just about getting money to governments uh, to do something quickly, but also the fact that in order to even sign up for such a, you know, a scheme, such a type of insurance, it requires governments to put in place strong uh, risk preparedness uh, and management plans. Uh, in terms of you know, laying out how any payout would be spent to deal with an outbreak. Uh, now, this preparation makes a really big difference uh, when disaster strikes, mimicking real experience uh, in dealing with such challenges, or at least giving you know, some sort of uh, idea of where things uh, will be prioritized. You know, and for example, if you talk about real life experience, I was living in Abidjan, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, when COVID broke out. And it was incredibly impressive uh, to, to see the, the Ivoirian government's response. Um, they were so quick to roll out hand washing stations uh, to contain people within particular areas. Uh, and this really helped to slow the spread. Now, the reason that they were able to do that, they had experience with Ebola, right? So they knew. And the thing about having you know, insurance slash sort of risk preparedness schemes uh, is that uh, it basically helps to accelerate the preparedness by ensuring that governments and others are, are thinking through what would they do if, uh, if such uh, a situation uh, would manifest. Um, so that's the type of innovative financing model I think that can foster resilience uh, to health crises in developing countries, obviously together with, with many other things that we've heard about uh, today. I just wanna end by saying donors actually have an opportunity uh, to help uh, in this area, uh, again, given the strapped resources in African governments, uh, to provide countries with, and I insist on this, digressive funding. Uh, so funding that reduces over time to pay insurance premiums. Um, you know, the idea is that you're building up this culture of risk and understanding of insurance uh, over time, making sure that people understand what they get for it um, at the same time uh, that uh, governments are having to develop their fiscal capacity. So we heard about domestic resource mobilization, very important, uh, and that this over time will allow uh, such uh, sort of market-based schemes uh, financial schemes to, to take root. Uh, and I think these types of mechanisms are extremely interesting and certainly worth looking into and supporting uh, and scaling up. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. And if I can come back to CEO Okiri, I want to ask what are some of the reasons why low-income countries, and especially those in Africa and Asia, might not be able to finance the basic health services and financial protection needed to provide sustainable health care. And you being in the front line, uh, how does your company approach the issue of universal health care and what financial mechanisms and support would make it possible for you to extend your support to more of those who need it, but have limited means to pay for health care? Mm. Yeah, those, those are two questions in one. Thank you very much, but they're both very good questions. Now, you know, um, in low-income countries, there's very little to go around. 
Um, and there are always competing priorities. If I use Nigeria and some of the other African countries in sub-Saharan Africa as, as an example, energy is, 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 is a real priority for, for, for government. Um, you know, electricity is, it passes everything and it continues to be a challenge. We have challenges with infrastructure as well, roads and bridges. We have rural communities that might not have these amenities and are very hard to reach. Security of food and adequacy of food is also a real challenge. Many African and Asian countries are prone to natural disasters, earthquakes, floodings. Gosh, the floodings this year have been something else. So you have these countries that are really struggling. I mean, GDPs in the $2,000 range. Well, you have more developed countries having GDPs of about 64,000, 50,000, 40,000. It's almost incomparable to speak of, you know, investment in healthcare in the same breath when you consider this huge disparity. So that might be a reason why, you know, healthcare in some of these low income countries suffer so much and governments are not able to finance what is globally regarded as even basic healthcare services to, to their population. Um, you know, I, it would be pessimistic to then conclude that it would always have to be this way. But the truth is that, and I have to correct, make a correction. Um, I'm, I have a master's from London Business School, <laughs> not London School of Economics. I, I, I really didn't want to leave that uncorrected, lest my school get back in touch with me and say, hey, simple, are you denying us now? <laughs> There's a healthy competition between both schools, I imagine, the alumni of both schools. But uh, yeah, so as I was saying, this huge disparity, it, it, we, one can't be pessimistic about it. Because the truth of the matter is, if the right investments are made in energy, in infrastructure, in all these other things, it should have a ripple effect on the country's ability to then increase its GDP to be more productive, for the economic indices to, to, to improve and then to be able to afford to now invest more and more in health. And so I'm an optimist at heart and I believe that is what we should begin to see more and more of. And things are getting better in the healthcare sector of many of these countries. As for universal healthcare and how my own company approaches it, I mean, we are really committed to it. Um, our, our mission is to empower people across Nigeria and everywhere we operate to live healthier and fuller lives and for them to have access to healthcare services when they need it without uh, lack of adequate financing being a hindrance or a reason why they die. That, that we are totally committed to. And we make this real in many ways. So we don't just provide health plans for private individuals, or corporate organizations. We also work with communities and state governments. Mm. So we offer community health insurance schemes, especially when there are corporates in that community that is willing to contribute something as a form of CSR. So we worked with Shell in one of their host communities before at Idemili in the Eastern part of the country. Um, right now we're working with Lagos State and we've worked with um, Lagos State also in um, quite economically challenged communities, what we call indigenous communities that otherwise would not be able to afford healthcare services. And there was an international donor that made that possible. So these are the ways in which we are also working and doing our own bit to help the country to achieve universal health coverage. Um, we were also a leading voice in the advocacy that gave us the new law, which we now have. And we believe that our advocacy doesn't just stop with the law that has been passed that makes health insurance compulsory for all residents of Nigeria. There's implementation of the law. There's also health education. You spoke about it earlier on. I think it was Professor Lemma that talked about um, healthcare being looked at, not just at curative and rehabilitative, but also preventive. So a lot has to happen around health education. 
and um, we're leading voice in that because people have to even know about the advantages of subscribing to a healthcare plan and why that is more beneficial to them than waiting until they are ill and God forbid it's a catastrophic illness, then what do they do? So these are the ways in which we are trying as a company to push forward the country's progress in, in terms of universal health coverage. Now, what kind of financial mechanisms do we need and support will make it easier for us? We believe that, you know, now that the law has been passed, we need all the state governments because we operate a federal system of government in Nigeria. And this is a federal law, meaning it's, it's, it's you know, all the states of the Federation are, are bound by it. But implementation of that is another thing. And we do need state governments to also begin to set aside a certain percentage of their funding towards helping the indigents of that state that cannot otherwise afford healthcare services, whether by paying out of pocket or even subscribing to a healthcare plan. And there's been talk in Nigeria, for instance, about a, a telecoms tax um, surprisingly, you know, given the state of the economy, we, the telecom sector is a sector that doesn't seem to suffer from lack of um, what we call real demand. You know, we see what is being spent on purchase of airtime and data and all of that. And, you know, as, as we are lobbying for something to be done, some kind of um, healthcare levy that can then be used to take care of you know, people who otherwise, what we call the vulnerable people in the society who are living above, or sorry, below poverty or at or below poverty level, so that they are not shut out of, of the healthcare, um, they don't, they're not shut out of the healthcare system and they continue to have access to the healthcare needs that, that they have. Um, these are just some of the ways that come to mind. I know some of the other African countries also have some similar healthcare levies and taxes. I believe Kenya has one um, where the there's a levy on airlines or something of that nature when I was reading about it. In Botswana, there's an alcohol levy, which is interesting, you know. Um, in Zimbabwe, there's an AIDS levy, you know. So these are some of the ways in which governments can also work with us to further improve um, the progress being made on achieving universal health coverage. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, CEO Okiri. Uh, I have some more questions, but uh, we need to have a little uh, brief answers uh, now if we also want uh, some time for a question and uh, answers from the uh, audience. So, so uh, I will have some small questions and of course uh, we don't have enough time for very elaborate uh, answers. Uh, we can only uh, touch uh, very briefly on the different matters, but uh, try your best to uh, to be brief. So, uh, more or less directly, uh, all three of you uh, have talked about uh, the need for uh, having some priority areas in uh, this field. So, how uh, would we find out what are priority areas? And I guess there must be a lot of discussion on that, and, and probably also a lot of uh, disagreement, and probably. Uh, the priority areas will be uh, different from country to country, continent to continent, probably. Uh, but do we have any evidence uh, about what should be uh, number one priority, second and third? Do we have evidence on that? And, and this is a question to all three of you, if you have some brief comments on this. So I don't know if any of us are health experts, probably Simbo's the most. Um, but I, I do think we have some ideas um, of things that, that we need to focus on. And, and Lema talked about it a bit before. I think preventative uh, medicine is hugely, hugely important. And, and Simbo can talk about how that saves a lot down the line. Um, uh, I think training um, staff, I'll just throw a few out and then I'll let everybody else go. Um, and I think it, it given that that takes time, it takes a long time. I've heard things like hundreds of years it'll take to get enough doctors and nurses, but um, that huge power that Lemma was talking about, about um, uh, technologies uh, and, and you know, kind of health tech, FinTech kind of stuff, um, that can make a huge, huge difference in getting out, especially given how many people have access now, at least to mobile phones, uh, and more and more smartphones. So uh, that's just my stab at it. But although I'll say like what really is needed is 
well-functioning healthcare systems. And the problem is that we're looking at everything in silos, whereas we really need to take a horizontal approach. Uh, okay, so I buy into what Jennifer said. Um, uh, one is on the preventive side. I, I really think that primary uh, healthcare on the health side is very important. We are talking about healthcare financing as well. So really a priority in terms of enabling financial inclusion. The reason is that this is also a space of duality where financial inclusion meets health inclusion. We have a hugely unbanked population in low-income countries, hugely under healthcare, underserved population in that same region. This is a meeting of the two. So, and, and then I think the other thing that uh, uh, the CEO mentioned from Nigeria, I know that uh, you are very worried about, you know, the, uh, you know, this kind of uh, the optimistic, pessimistic scenario, but no, it really brought back the idea that everything has to be integrated. We're grappling with same kinds of issues, economic transformation, financial sector development, health healthcare, finance, and healthcare has to be at the center of that. And, and I think I'm going to stop it because we want, we want things to be brief. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, actually, I, I agree with both of you. I just will add a few more. Um, what we have seen, you know, having a huge impact is really, you know, preventive. And um, th that, that whole mindset of just educating people and moving them away from when I fall ill, I will go and look for healthcare services to how do I lead my life? in order not to fall so ill that I, I need healthcare services. I mean, um, it's something that I said we are in the forefront of, and we can see the difference between us and other populations that our competitors also have, uh, have in, the, in the industry. Um, I want to add that, you know, that intersection between health and technology is really, really important. You know, across Africa and in other low-income countries in Asia, other parts of the world, hard to reach areas are gaining a lot through telemedicine. In fact, during COVID-19, when nobody could move, we set up a telemedicine function. And it was amazing that everybody that needed to access healthcare services, at least that didn't need a doctor to perform a procedure, we provided healthcare services. In spite of the fact that people weren't able to leave the comfort of their homes, the doctors were able to take video and telephone consultations, were able to send people to their home to take samples to the lab, you know, and drugs were prescribed, there were deliveries happening with medication, you know, and it just reopened really everyone's eyes to, in, in far to reach or rural areas, telemedicine can make a lot of difference and it reduces the cost as well. So, I mean, these are just some of the areas that I think that doing a little in those areas can have a huge impact. I would, I would choose those two first. Thank you. Thank you. My other question is also, uh, one other question is also, uh, which you have touched upon uh, uh, panelists, and this is the question about coordination and efficiency. Uh, Jennifer mentioned that we might have more than 100 organizations working in this field. And uh, uh, Professor Lemon was also talking about efficiency. So uh, some reasons for some donors maybe to stay away. Can that be maybe too much inefficiency in the system? And maybe some donors feel that they're not getting enough uh, for their money. I'll start again if you don't um, give it, leave it to New Yorker, you know, I mean, I haven't lived in the US in many, many years, but if we don't speak quickly, we don't get a word in edgewise. Um, yeah, so I think in terms of coordination, everybody knows that you need to have more coordination. Uh, and, you know, Simba was talking, I mean, we, we're seeing it, they're trying. Um, I was uh, at um, a number of discussions at the, you know, country level where, Everybody got together and talked about the fact that the country had to lead. But the truth of the matter is, and this is not only true in healthcare, it's true across the board. Individual organizations have their own KPIs. They have their own, you know, sort of role. So everybody, I think that people really have the best of intentions, but then they go back home 
and they wake up and then they have to deal with all the stuff they do in their own organization. And so there has to be like a really, I think a debt, I don't know about centralized coordination, but there has to be a really forceful decision on the part of the major donors to coordinate. Uh, and to listen to others, because the other side of this, and I won't mention names, but some of the biggest money, whether it's DFIs or they also can be very bossy and telling everybody else what to do, and sometimes not necessarily listening to the regional organizations. So I think there has to be, you know, somehow an understanding that definitely countries have to be in the lead, that we keep talking about this and it doesn't get done. And that in order to do it, we have to understand that we maybe have to start working a little bit differently and maybe aligning our KPIs and all of the things that make everybody go back to the office and do what actually they do on a daily basis. We're all people, right? It's just people trying to get through the day. So, and, and I think, especially if you look at healthcare or areas like this, people who really wanna make a positive difference. And yet, you know, they have kids to pick up from school. They have so many other things to do. So just how can we make it easier? Thank so maybe you. What, what, what I wanted to add, uh, something just came up to my mind, uh, talking about coordination. I think I think as a bigger picture, um, I don't think there is enough of sharing of information across mm. the region. So we have uh, the, the largest trade agreement, you know, AFCFTA, and largest in, the, in terms of uh, population and number of countries. And I think COVID-19 has been really an awakening for a speedy implementation of that. And especially in the healthcare finance, the whole area of integrating finance across national boundaries would be very, very helpful. Again, uh, as I said, in, in, in the context of the overall uh, financial uh, development strategy, and in fact, the African financial systems are so thin in terms of scale and balkanized, segmented, and you can't really achieve that without, without implementing that uh, trade agreement um, in, in a speedy and substantive way. And this is probably also another wake up call. I just wanted to add that. And then also, I know that we keep on mentioning capacity building. It's so key. Even if we mention it many times, please take serious account of that. One of the reasons that we have an issues is that we have a shortage of talented manpower, you know, lack of skills. So that is also one place where donors play a role. It's just not just money, but also technical assistance uh, in these areas. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think I'm an expert in this area, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I'm more a foot on the road, hands-on kind of player in the healthcare system. So I don't have that sort of top level holistic um, view of the coordination and collaboration that happens. But what I can say is that sometimes there's not enough skills on the country's side. Yeah. And um, that might also be an area to look at. Because I understand that donors, of course, want the for every buck, they want maximum impact, you know? And um, when working with partners that might not necessarily have the right level of skills, then the spending is not gonna be efficient, you know? Um, monitoring and evaluation in particular are areas that, you know, they're not enough skills. I can say, I, I don't think we have enough skills in, in, in that area, you know, from what I've seen in, in Nigeria, in the work that I've that I've been exposed to. So just, you know, some technical parts when it comes to, and healthcare as a whole, I mean, I'm not a doctor, but I've ended up in this sector. And I can see that, you know, the kind of business management skills and sometimes often organizational management skills that are taken for granted in other sectors are a bit lacking or not quite at the same level when it comes to the healthcare sector. Because you know it's such an emotive subject and people are quite passionate about it. It's social good, it's all of that. But you don't need, you do also need the rigor <laughs> and the you know high level of robust, you know, monitoring and challenging and you know, all, all of that that happens in sectors outside the healthcare sector. 
So, I mean, th this is just the contribution I have to this, to this particular issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me jump to some questions from the audience. Uh, we have Salim. Uh, Salim, are you there? Uh, please uh, present yourself, uh, your name and your organization and which country you're from. Maybe Salim cannot hear me. Yes, Salim is there. Please. Okay, we cannot hear you, Salim, but maybe uh, either you can try again a little later or you can uh, post the questions to the question and answer uh, chat. In the question and answer chat, uh, chat. We have a question from Yushada, uh, who says, Dear CEO, I am from Kano and working with Keystone Bank. I would like Avon to register with Amino Kano Teaching Hospital Retainership Platform. So that would be a question to CEO uh, Ukiri, please. Yes, thank you. That's not quite a question. That's oh, that's sort of like a, a, a request, and I will take that request on board. I will confirm if we are not, and we will establish contact with them. It's a teaching hospital, so what we will tend to do is we would be using them for tertiary care services. So they, we would not probably be using them for primary care. And if you don't get really seriously ill, you might not have had access to, to, to the teaching hospital because, I mean, we don't really use them for primary care, but I will find out, I assume they're already on our network, but they'll be there as a tertiary level provider, not a primary care provider. Well, thank you, I will look into it. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I think we have Salim on board now. No, not really. Uh, Salima, please post your question to, I think you have muted yourself. Uh, can you unmute? Okay, uh, Salim, please uh, uh, put your question to the question and answer uh, chat. And uh, in the meantime, uh, let me get back to, because we have a few minutes left. Let me get back to the question about uh, private uh, companies uh, uh, meeting the needs of uh, 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 the social uh, area or the health area. Uh, of course, there's a lot of, uh, there's sometimes some debate about uh, where uh, one should profit from the healthcare sector, but that's a different discussion. Uh, I would just like to uh, ask, uh, I think, it was Professor Lemon who talked about uh, this uh, issue, uh, and my question is like, what uh, uh, keep what might keep uh, uh, private companies away from the uh, healthcare sector? Uh, of course, there's a question about uh, risk, I imagine, and maybe uh, the other question, the other issue could be uh, the potential uh, uh, payoff from investments in uh, in the healthcare sector, and I guess we are again talking about low income countries. Yeah, I think um, you have actually answered the question, right? So, and um, this is, I think, exemplified by what I began observing about the uh, global investment fund. And, and I felt like going through this documentation, maybe Jennifer could actually weigh in here. I had difficulty really understanding the track record. Then I started thinking, okay, what are the challenges? Uh, so here we are saying that uh, we have these late start technologies, which are risky, and then, and then promising uh, a financial rate of return that is competitive, and at the same time, social impact. That's uh, huge, right? And of course, for that to happen, first of all, you need to, you need to tap to, into those individuals who are social impact minded, right? I don't think if you just go to plain vanilla, 
you know, rank and file, you'll be able to get much attention. And then even if you do that, um, given that there is a profit agenda in the background, unless you have clear risk management and mitigation strategies, uh, it's, you know, you'll, you'll not be able to, uh, to do that. And, and uh, the other is, uh, we, don't, we don't have much track record, is that right? And as a result, uh, these are basically uh, new, basically the kind of new entrants in the low income countries. So uh, that's why I think earlier, the whole idea of uh, partnership, regional integration, cooperation across the region would actually help because for instance, in the case of finance, if we end up integrating finance, it will actually enhance our integration into the global economy. And, 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 and for the same reason, um, if we do something that have through cooperation, it may achieve the same outcome. So um, yeah, maybe those of you are actually studying this fund um, and I would like to hear from Jennifer actually. <clears throat> well, I wouldn't say I'm studying the fund, um, <laughs> yeah. but I, 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 I do, I'm a huge fan of social enterprise, yeah. right? And I think it's gotta be our future. Um, and even, I mean, if you talk about what, what Simbo does, I mean, this is social enterprise in a certain way, right? Because right. social enterprise isn't about you don't make money. It's just about what is your purpose, right? And so, and when I look at Africa, uh, I see an army of social entrepreneurs, young people, they want to make a difference. And so it's a question of sort of unleashing that power. Um, and so any of these funds, it would be about kind of supporting that. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a healthcare fund, uh, to be perfectly honest, um, because this is the goods and services that people don't have and that they need. And it's a question of providing them in a different way, because honestly, if you look at the globe, we're leaving lots of people behind. And meanwhile, we're burning down the planet, you know, so in general, business, I think, has to be done in a different way. And that comes back to this question of regulation. You know, governments have to regulate these things. They have to make it attractive. And they also have to make it easier to create these sorts of enterprises because it's not obvious. It's not clear what kind of paperwork uh, to hand in. In some countries you have. To... So I think there's a huge amount to be done. Um, and in general, there's always a blend of public and private in, in healthcare, any country you go to, right? I mean, the balance will be a little different. Um, and so, you know, it's it's gotta be the same. Uh, in developing countries. And I think that if you wait for government to do everything, you're going to wait a really long time um, because government just won't figure it out. So you have to unleash you know, this innovation. And I think it will make a huge, huge difference. Uh, and whether it's that fund or whatever fund, you know, I mean, I, I guess it's going to be another fund, but you know, you got to get funding to where uh, the innovation is and the innovation that is done in a way that brings as many people along uh, and takes care of the planet in the meantime. So I think uh, you're right, there's really huge potential. There's, there's no question about that. I think one of the reasons also is that uh, people do not seem to appreciate that you can in fact make money, right? I serve on this uh, fund board, <laughs> basically. They started uh, having a, a larger number of what they call ESG, ESG funds. In the past, there was this thinking that if you end up detracting from profit objective, you end up less, making less money. That's not the case. It turns out that we have a track record out there where you can actually make money and also socially impact. So one of which is really uh, information gap. The other, I think, by the way, I don't think when you talk about finance, we should not lose sight of the fact that finance doesn't work unless there is proper financial regulation. So, and there also there is a, a capacity element. So, so I want to actually close with that. Without that, uh, there's no finance, okay? So which means that uh, we need to make sure that we also have infrastructure, which is best practice regulation as these guys actually innovate. If that's not there, that's also a deterrent uh, as are to the to potential uh, private investors. I think our time is almost over, but yes. if any of you have uh, some question that you would really ask to, really like to ask the other panelists, uh, please go ahead. Maybe I think we have a little time for one last question from any of you to any of the others. I could quickly just bring in one issue, which is complexity, because I think that healthcare is probably more complex than just about any other, also because it touches on human, you know, the human of us. Um, and so, you know, how I would be interested to know how um, how you guys in what you do sort of, you know, wade through that. 
um, to synthesize uh, down to to the basics. Um, because for me, it's it's quite a challenge. I, I and and both of you talked about that a bit. Uh, you can't do just healthcare. It's everything. I mean, you have to be making the economy work. You have to be creating jobs. You know, um, you have to. But you know when I look at it as a development economist where everything's interlinked with everything, my argument for healthcare would be, uh, and it's the same for nutrition, if you don't have healthy bodies and brains, you're wasting money on education, for example, right? So I just would love to hear, like, I mean, it's more maybe a philosophical, but how you guys sort of think about that. Okay, our CEO. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think for... Um, People who tend to work in healthcare and who remain in healthcare, it becomes almost like a lifelong passion. I don't want to call it a religion, um, but it's 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 you're in healthcare because you care deeply and you do want to make a difference. And at the bottom, at the base of everything that we do, that is what propels, that is what gives resilience, that is what um, serves as the purpose, the compass for, are we really making lives better? That's at the end of the day, you know, are we making lives better? You know, um, have we been able to reach more people? Have more people have access to healthcare because we exist? Are people leading healthier lives and therefore being more productive, like you said, and having their economic situation improve? So at the end of the day, I think that's the question, that's what's at the core that then spurs on everything that all the people in healthcare do. It's are we really people, are we really giving people better lives? And are people living better, more productive lives? Are we having impact with more and more people? And every day when we see some progress, no matter how little it is in the scheme of the world's population and the huge problems in healthcare globally, no matter what progress we see, it gives us the urge to continue. And I think that's what the story is going to be. I, I don't know that, we, I mean, sometimes we celebrate huge things like the eradication of polio in Nigeria earlier this year, that was huge. You know, like how the world came together on COVID-19 and it's no longer the kind of threat it was to us at its peak. That's huge. And for me personally, also seeing how much the Nigerian healthcare system, the kind of resilience and effectiveness and efficiency <laughs> during that period, it was impressive. That kept, you know, it just keeps you burning to do more. And I guess that, 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 that would be my answer to that question. It is complex. And when we think about it, it's almost as if, if we don't get healthcare right, we will continue as a country and as a region to falter and to not be able to move well, you know? And um, yeah, it's complex, but it's such a huge responsibility if you ask okay. me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, our time is over. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Professor Lema, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jennifer, and thank you very much, CEO uh, at the Simbo. It was very uh, nice discussion, very interesting subjects, and I know the discussion is not at all over. We could continue, I think, for hours, uh, but I think we have it uh, to leave it there, and I pass uh, it on to uh, Paul Frimbo. Uh, thank you, and bye-bye. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, uh, uh, gentlemen and ladies. We very much are fortunate to have gotten the opportunity to share today with you. And of course, the insight that we've shared, uh, we say a big thank you from the ICC uh, and we'll come your way, of course, with uh, reports of these sessions and some of the uh, uh, clips that we'll get out of this session. Uh, so we say a big thank you to you uh, for agreeing to join us today and for gracing our first edition of the Global Economic Ideas Festival. So audience, please, we have our next session in the next five or so minutes. We'll send emails again. I'm sure you can check your email so you can get a correct link to join it's about climate financing, a very interesting topic as well. So I hope that all of you will transition to join us in the next session. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. See you thank bye you. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thank you. I hope to talk to you again. Me too. Bye. Bye. bye.